Good morning. It's really cool to have you all here. I enjoyed meeting about half of you yesterday, and I'll meet the rest of you uh, today and tomorrow, and it's really cool. I'm looking forward to it. Really good energy, really good people and stuff. That uh, should be cool. If you have uh, the lab section today or tomorrow, we will go over how the course works and stuff during that time. So there's nothing to do uh, until you have this first lecture from me in lab and stuff. So we'll just kind of hang out. And in the meantime, what we'll do is we'll continue on with chapter one. We left off on uh, Monday talking about the states of matter. And all substances, at least in theory, can exist in multiple states, which means it's the same compound, but the way the molecules are oriented uh, makes them different. And the best example of that by far is water, all right? Um, I see in your drink right there that you have ice and you have a liquid. You have two states of matter. Uh, and again, the ice and the liquid water, they're both H2O, the same stuff. It's just that the solid has a different orientation orientation of the water molecules. And if you had a hot drink, you would have probably steam over it, and that would be like the third phase, which would be like a gas. And in theory, all right, all substances should have these kind of things. We were talking about bromine earlier. Bromine is one that's easy to get into the liquid or the gas phase, but you can actually make solid pieces of that too. Each of the phases has a different uh, property, which can be helpful. Solids are very rigid. So uh, if we got one of the ice cubes and we put it here on the table, we could measure its length, its width, and its height in theory and get an idea there. Um, and solids, as we're going to see in Chem 222 more than this term, are pretty well understood. Like it's easy to predict how the different molecules come together. Uh, liquids, on the other hand, which of course dominate our world in terms of water, liquids have no shape, uh, no fixed shape. Their volume is uh, kind of depends on what's around it and stuff. Liquids are very hard to describe in terms of math. And this is an interesting thing. Um, there's a lot of work being done on how best to describe the behavior of liquids when it comes to systems. On the other hand, the one that you think, at least I would think, would be the hardest to understand, gases. Gases have actually been really well understood and will argue in Chem 222 that the birth of chemistry really happened around the exploration of gases. And that seems kind of counterintuitive because if I said, hey, look at my gas, and I open my hand, woo, the gas goes away, right, and stuff. So it doesn't make sense on one level that gases would help us to understand chemistry. But the people around the early 1800s, that's what they were experiencing. And gases are actually pretty well understood. Gases, of course, will expand to reach whatever volume they've got. So the gas in my hand has a very small volume, but I open up my hand, the gas will, in theory, then go so it's equally distributed around this room. Now, on the planet Earth, where we live, at least most of the time, <laughs> anyway, solids, liquids, and gases dominate, all right? We breathe the air, we sit on the ground, we drink water and stuff like that. There is a fourth phase of matter, and it's called plasma. This is different than the blood plasma. You might have heard of it, a plasma clinic, all right? It's actually a whole different state of matter. It's the substance of lightning, of supernovas, and stuff like that. Um, we'll talk more about it in Chem 222. But I would be remiss as your, as your instructor to at least not mention the fact that plasma is a player. According to the kinetic molecular theory, the molecules of a solid are locked in place, though they have motion. Molecules of a liquid are closely associated with each other, but move relative to one another. Molecules of a gas move independently and occupy a much larger volume than those of a corresponding liquid or solid. The kinetic molecular theory, which we'll often abbreviate KMT because who wants to say all the syllables? The KMT is oftentimes used to describe the differences between solids, liquids, and gases. So again, thinking in the phases of water, which we're hopefully familiar with, each of these little blue balls would be like a water molecule, okay? And if this was a piece of ice, of solid water, the individual water molecules very, very close to each other. And if you watch that animation, they are moving a little bit, but it's a lot, lot less than the other ones. <clears throat> 
Now in a liquid, the water molecules you can see are kind of more inner space. They move around a lot more. There is a connection between the water molecules, but it's much weaker than the connection is over there. And I say that because the movement of the water molecules is quite a bit less than the solids than they would be in the liquids. So that's why when you pour the water, the water does stay together, but the volume, the shape of it will change. All right? On the other hand, gases, there's really no interaction between the individual water molecules. So if you have steam, those gas molecules, you know, sound effects not necessary, they're kind of going wherever they want to. So you can see that one thing that helps scientists determine the difference between solids, liquids, and gases is how the water molecules or whatever substance it is, how they interact with each other. And there's pretty strong forces over here. There's almost no forces here, and this is kind of in between. In Chem 222, we'll investigate this phenomenon further. They're called intermolecular forces, but just realize that there is like a type of a glue that holds water together, and that's what makes the difference between ice and liquid water and steam. What the? How can I help? I'm not even a scientist. Wow, you have the most important job of all. You'll be our test monkey. Test monkey? Okay, my apologies for the bad SpongeBob reference, but anyway, I uh, really want this KMT idea to be stuck in your head, all right? So what I'd like, I'd love to have three volunteers down here while I show some kind of chemistry magic. There's one, good, thank you. Second one, good too. Third one? Yeah, good. All right, oh cool, that's up. Thank you. We, you can be a fourth one if you want and stuff. Three. Okay, yeah, all right. Four is even better. Oh, coolest class already. I've always had just three. This is cool to have four. <laughs> Good. All right. So these four people are going to be like my molecules. Think of them as each an individual water molecule. All right? And this is so awesome. Look how they lined up. It's beautiful, man, because this is the solid. All right? Now, all of you take one step forward and one step back. Yep. So you can see that more or less they're kind of in the same thing and stuff like that. They more or less went forward and back. This is what a solid does, all right? Now, it's not perfect, like you were being a rebel. Yes, because, uh, like rebellious people. Anyway, not all the molecules are going to be the same as the other ones, and that's also normal too. But more or less all of the molecules went forward and back. That's what solid is. If you have a piece of ice and you push it, of course, the ice stays together. There's a little bit of mediation. Now, what I'm going to do is use my proverbial magic wand and raise the temperature. So now we're no longer a solid, we're going to have a liquid. So all of you kind of like dance, but dance around each other. <laughs> kind of, yeah, you can move, yeah, <laughs> oh my good, be a little rebellious, I love it. Yeah, this is what a liquid is, man. This is why liquids are hard to figure out, all right? This dancing movement, very chaotic. People are using chaos theory and math to figure out what the liquids are and stuff. But they're all together, all right? <clears throat> Solids, you know, very rigid, forward and backward, no problem. The liquids are kind of moving around and stuff, kind of like the disco. <laughs> That's totally fine, all right? Now, for my last magic trick, I'm going to raise the temperature even more and turn you all into a gas. Go back to your seats. Good, so see, this is perfect now. Now there's no interaction. They're all going to their different places and stuff to figure out where it is. Please join me in giving them a little hand for me. <laughs> My I know, but this is the kinetic molecular theory, all right? The solid's very rigid. Notice I raised the temperature. Then you got the dancing liquids. Finally, I raised the temperature even more. They all went back to their desk. Sometimes I'll call them anarchists because there's no connection. Notice that I raised the temperature. That's another thing we're going to see, too. Solids will usually exist at a lower temperature, liquids in the middle, gases up above. There's a few differences in there we'll talk about in Chem 222, but as a general rule of thumb, that's very appropriate. Same question for me. Cool. So, energy is a part of chemistry. And a lot of times people think that chemistry is just matter transformations, all right? But actually, there's a lot of uh, chemistry that's involved with energy as well, all right? <clears throat> 
if you have a solid going to a liquid and a liquid going to a gas, which is what I had all my cool volunteers do just a second ago, those are reactions that take energy, and scientists refer to them as endothermic. So an endothermic reaction is just a reaction that takes energy, all right? It's not going to happen unless you apply some energy to it. On the other hand, I could have, I guess, argued that everybody was a gas, they came down here and started dancing, and that was a liquid, and then I made them very rigid a solid. Those kind of reactions actually release energy, all right? And so those reactions are often called exothermic. So exothermic energy is being released by the system you're looking at. And an endothermic reaction, you need energy to make those kind of things happen. All right? If you drove here today in a gas-powered vehicle, the gas process is exothermic. It creates energy that moves the pistons and all that kind of stuff. Um, on the other hand, there are lots of examples of endothermic reactions. Uh, one of the ones you might be familiar with is if you've had a sports injury and those, those cold packs, the cold comes from an endothermic process. So for right now, just realize that exo energy is given off, endo energy is needed. A physical property and a chemical property are also things that you can use to describe chemical systems. All right? <clears throat> Physical properties are really cool. I'm going to let you in on a little secret. Chemists mostly make money by identifying substances and purifying substances. And that's a horrible, gross generalization. Let me also say that. However, that is a big part of it. So if you're a scientist, if you're a chemist, and someone says, what is this? One of the things you'll probably use will be the physical properties. You'll try and measure them, and then see if you can identify the compound. Now, all the physical properties don't change the composition of the substance, all right? So what this means is you can do these physical property studies over and over again, and the substance will still be there. For example, color, right? You look at it. It's not going to change color, you would hope anyway. That would be an example of a physical property. Melting and boiling points are good examples too. So for example, you could take liquid water and freeze it. That would be where it froze, that would be the freezing point. On the other hand, you could take liquid water, heat it to a steaming gas, that would be the boiling point. And in theory, you could collect the steam and condense it back to a liquid. And in theory, you could take that piece of ice, melt it, and turn it back into a liquid. So those are the kind of things that are flexible. Um, odor should be a process too. <clears throat> So notice here how like melting and boiling had a change involved with them, but it's a reversible change. So if you boil or melt something, those are physical changes. All right, you're not gonna you're gonna be able to get it back. On the other hand, in lab this week, if you had lab yesterday or when you have lab today or tomorrow, we're gonna be using something called a solution. And in theory, having a solution is also a physical change. In theory, you should be able to get the stuff that you deserve all back if you would evaporate water. I'm saying in theory a lot, and I apologize. <laughs> uh, I want to be very clear and as, as, uh, as accurate as possible. There are some times when making a solution is a one-way street. But more often than not, you can get what you dissolve back if you carefully evaporate the water. So knowing that, let's do another eye clicker question. All right, <clears throat> and again, if you have your eye clicker, get it out. Um, your eye clicker will look something like this, but it's white. This is an optional thing to have. You do not have to have it. Um, however, if you do have it and you participate in 15 lectures, you get a little extra credit. But even if you don't have an eye clicker, which is totally fine, all right, just like see if you can figure out the answer, all right, and then we'll check ourselves. We'll talk about what's actually happening. So in this eye clicker question, I'm saying which of these is not a physical change? And remember, the physical changes are reversible things. So you're freezing a liquid to form a solid. Do you think you could take the solid and melt it to make a liquid? Yeah, probably. All right, probably that would be reversible and stuff. 
Uh, we talked about earlier how making a solution is reversible, so that's okay. Here's evaporating water into a gas. That should be reversible if we collected the steam. But burning a piece of paper, right? So let's say you get a bill from someone, you're like, oh, and you burn it. Oh, I shouldn't have burned that, man. Can you get the ashes turned back into the bill or into the piece of paper? No, no, no. Probably, that one's going to be pretty tough, man. So burning things is not a physical change, all right? If you burn that, you may not be able to get that back. You may have to call them for another version or something like that. Burning is an example of a chemical change we're going to see. And so that's an example of something that would be very, very difficult, and I would argue in this case probably impossible to get the paper back. <clears throat> Sublimation is another type of transformation that occurs. Substances <clears throat> will go um, uh, from ice to gas. If you do the pressure and or temperature right, this is possible. It's almost Halloween. If you use carbon dioxide, dry ice, and like Kool-Aid or <clears throat> whatever, uh, 21 and over drinks you might appreciate. Um, anyway, that carbon dioxide, a solid, is actually going into a gas directly. It's a sublimation process. We'll talk again more about all these changes and stuff in Chem 222, but you're aware of it. Any questions? Yes. Yeah, um, like when you we say physical change, mm -hmm. uh, like if we do like evaporation same thing, mm -hmm. we're gonna lose some 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 amount of water in the air because of evaporating. Correct. So when we put it again, the measurement is not gonna be the same as the first. So ah. What are we going to say to that? Okay, we're not measuring mass, all right? <clears throat> and I would argue that, yeah, you're going to lose some mass all the time, all right? But for the parts you collect, all right, then you can make the first <coughs> right on. We'll talk about how, yeah, most of the time the yield is not the same before and after, absolutely. And that's a very natural process. But for the parts you do collect, all right, then in theory you could then make them back into a liquid. But you're right, we'll talk about, like, uh, how much you can actually collect later on. That's a very normal process. So, so it's only for the parts you do collect. In theory, all right, you should be able to have some kind of apparatus that would get you pretty close to 100%, maybe not 100%, but like 99 or something. That's the part that we're referring to here. But we'll talk more about percentages coming up, you bet. Um, with exothermic and endothermic, um, when you say you mold something, what type When I say what? When you just like basically mold something, melt something, mm -hmm. that's, I suppose, the endothermic reaction because it's taken in the heat. Cool. So to going from uh, solid to liquid, like melting, yeah. and liquid to gas, those processes are always endothermic, that's right. And the reverse is true for exothermic. So if you go from gas to liquid, or liquid to solid, or gas to solid, those are always exothermic. Good. We'll talk more about energy um, about two thirds into this class, and that's one of the things we'll bring up. Well done. All right. We talked on uh, Monday a little bit <clears throat> about the, uh, having a balloon filled with hydrogen, and you light it and it turns into water. That's also an example of one of these chemical transformations. It's a chemical property of hydrogen and oxygen to combine, and the chemical change forming water from the hydrogen white and the oxygen red atoms, uh, that would be a transformation, and that would be a very difficult transformation to go back. Now, it's not impossible to break water back down to hydrogen and oxygen, but it's very tricky. You need to have electricity, some very sophisticated equipment, and going back to the percentage, how much you'd actually get, uh, which was a cool comment he made, yeah, that would be a pretty rough kind of thing. So if you have a chemical transformation you wish to good, there's some cool information you can get, but your sample will not be the same. It's probably going to be less than it was at the very least, or it could be totally altered. Uh, <clears throat> 
So again, physical properties don't change your composition. Uh, magnetism is another example of that. You can tell right away something is magnetic and it shouldn't affect it. On the other hand, poor coyote down here, chemical properties, uh, things will totally change and it's gonna be very difficult to go back to what you saw, all right? Cool. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I have a question. Yeah. So, when you are changing hydrogen into oxygen during mm -hmm. that burning process, mm -hmm. you said that there's a potential that it could be altered or not quite right. Would that mean that that water, if you were somehow able to harness it, could you drink it? Yeah, absolutely. That's right. Okay. In, in theory, the hydrogen oxygen should make pure water. And if you collect it, you know, and I would totally purify it and stuff before drinking it, but yeah, in theory, it should be totally drinkable and stuff. Mm -hmm. And there's always in the chemistry lab a little bit of uh, suspicion I would have you think about <laughs> because uh, you never know in the lab what's going to happen. But at least on a true philosophical, you know, pure state, it should be totally drinkable, you bet. Mm -hmm. When you are measuring things like boiling points or magnetism or as something we'll talk about here in the like density, you need to have uh, some way to measure it, all right? Now, mass is one you could say, oh yeah, this is heavier than this, like using your hands, but that's not very scientific for heaven's <laughs> sake. So there are um, types of measurements you can make to figure these things out. And when you measure things, you have to have a unit system. Now, I put these two little graphs up here because all of the countries in red, <laughs> United States basically and Sri Lanka or whatever, anyway, all the countries in red are the ones that use the old school, what I'm going to call the American units. And all the countries in green up here, which again is basically everything but the United States, <laughs> use the metric system. Uh, the metric system is a really cool set of units. Uh, I grew up here in Gresham, Oregon, and I learned about feet and, you know, pounds and stuff like that, and that's totally cool. However, I uh, obviously live in the little gray country right there. I wish I would have learned directly about the metric system. It's really cool. Powers of 10. All right, everything is, like, easier to calculate and stuff. Um, the reason why I bring it up is that in chemistry, the metric system is what we use. It's important to make connections between the measurements in chemistry and your real world. And we'll talk about those kind of things. But in this class, we will use like centimeters and meters and grams and kilograms and stuff like that. We're going to have a lot of metric units. Now, if you have used the metric system before, then this is going to be kind of a sleeper time for you. If you haven't used the metric system before, the good news is, is it's very easy to use. And I'll go over some examples of how you can use the metric system if it's a new thing. Uh, this is kind of funny. Miles Davis is one of my favorite jazz musicians. This is Kilometer Davis. A, bump, bump. a kilometer is shorter than a mile, so... All right, thank you for laughing. Anyway, here's some more jokes. There's tons of them. All right, here's Peanuts, so we'll see a centimeter. I'll step on them, ha, ha, ha. And then you can imagine the teacher going, quack, 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 like, shut up, Lucy. Okay, yes, ma'am. And then this one right here, this person got uh, his uh, significant other a metric dozen, so instead of 12, it would be 10, and you can probably imagine there's a little friction. So anyway, the metric system, lots of fun jokes, really silly and stuff, but again, this power of 10 is actually really cool. The power of 12 has some uses, definitely, but man, this power of 10 thing is cool. So as a scientist here at Mount Hood, I use metric system all the time, but when I go home and I'm kicking back, I watch on KPTV or whatever, I watch temperatures in Fahrenheit, and I think about how many miles to the store. So it's this weird dichotomy and stuff that you just have to kind of get used to dealing with. And it's not too bad, but it's a little weird. Here's an example of a question you might see when it comes to metrics, all right? And I have up here some conversions. Now, this is one of those problems. If the metric system is brand new to you, just make a guess, and that's fine. And we'll talk about how you can figure this out. But what I'd like to do in this problem is have you figure out the order of increasing size. Now, notice how these four measurements here, they have an M, and M stands for meter, all right? And meter is a type of metric unit that's length. But some of these have a centa and a milla, and those two are called metric prefixes. 
Now, between just these two, obviously 0.125 is smaller than 2.3. So <coughs> of the list down here, this one should be first and that one should be second. Milla and Centa are very common in the metric system. And so one way to do it is that 100 centimeters is one meter and 1,000 millimeters is one meter. So if you want, you can take the millimeter and try to convert it over into meters by dividing by a thousand. So this would be 0.215 meters, all right? On the other hand, if you take nine centimeters and divide it by a hundred, that will tell you how many meters you have. So nine divided by a hundred is 0.09. So if you put those then in order, 0 0.09 meters, or nine centimeters, would be the smallest. 0.125 meters would be the next one. This one we said was 0.215 meters, or 215 millimeters. And finally, this would be the biggest one of all. So notice here how in the metric system, these are all length-based. So the base unit, they call it, is the meter. But we also used them of what's called the prefixes, all right, the metric prefixes, to figure out which one is going on. Any questions? <clears throat> there are five metric prefixes which we're going to use a lot in chemistry, all right? Now, in the metric world, there's many, many, many different prefixes, all right? And some of them you'll be familiar with. For example, megabyte and gigabyte, mega and giga, are two of the metric prefixes. But in chemistry, these five metric prefixes are ones you need to know slash memorize, because we're going to use these over and over and over again. And I don't want you, you know, getting out your phone and trying to convert millimeters into meters or something like that. It's really cool just to know these right away. Now, kilometer or kilo, kilo stands for 10 to the third. So if your unit is length, like we saw earlier then, a kilometer or kilometer, you can pronounce either way, is equal to a thousand or 10 to the third meters. A centimeter is worth 10 to the minus two meters, or centa and 10 to the minus two are connected. Now, sometimes what people do is they move the 10 to the minus 2 to the other side. And when you do that, 10 to the minus 2 becomes 10 to the positive 2. So earlier, it said 100 centimeters equals 1 meter. 10 to the positive 2 is 100. So one of the things that gets kind of strange is you can go back and forth on these different things. Kilometer, centimeter millimeter, those are ones you might have heard of and dealt with other things. But two that you may not be as familiar with, one of them is called the micro. Micro is used a lot in biology, and large molecules will correspond to a biological kind of a thing. Micro means 10 to the minus 6. Notice its cool little symbol there. It looks like a U with a long uh, line in front of it. That's a Greek symbol. Greek symbols are used a lot in chemistry. So if you see that little thing, that's a micrometer, and a micrometer is 10 to the minus 6 meters. And the nano is one we'll use a lot, especially towards the end of Chem 221. A nano is 10 to the minus 9. Nanos are really helpful when we talk about the properties of light, and we'll see that, how that can be kind of helpful. Now, why these things are so cool is that, like we talked about on Monday, the distances between the atoms or the sizes of the atoms are so small. So people can actually measure the distance between the oxygen and hydrogen in water. And it's 9.4 times 10 to the minus 11th meters. And that's a really unwieldy number, right? Who wants to write out times 10 to the something? <laughs> It's much nicer to have different types of metric units so that you can convert. So if you didn't want to call it 10 to the minus 11 meters, you could call it 10 to the minus 9 centimeters, 10 to the minus 5 micrometers, 0 0.094 nanometers. They all mean the same thing. And so sometimes one type of unit will be easier than others. 
chemists really are, when it comes right down to it, lazy people. And sometimes you don't want to write times 10 to the, where's that superscript symbol? Minus 11, all right, we'll get it back down to normal. Sometimes it's nice to just have them in base kind of things. So these five we're going to use over and over and over, and they're five that you should know slash memorize, all right, because we'll use these a lot as we go through the class. There's actually, as I said, a whole bunch of different metric prefixes. You do not have to know any of them outside of those five right there. But you've probably heard of like terabytes, gigabytes, megabytes. Those are metric prefixes. And then there's also weird ones like DESA and PICO and FEMTO. But we, those aren't ones that you need to know. Those five are ones we're going to use over and over and over again. In the companion are some handouts that will help you to figure out the metric versions and how to convert one to the other. This one's kind of funny. <laughs> Here's this poor dude. He goes, he sees, ah, water, nine kilometers, water, 50 meters. Oh, 50 is a lot bigger than nine. <laughs> this would be, of course, nine times 10 to the third, 9,000 meters and stuff, so poor all right, I have a strange sense of it. <laughs> anyway, this leads us into uh, a really useful physical property of all substances, and it's called density. And uh, density is kind of cool. There is an old joke, and I'll probably say this multiple times, so I apologize in advance, but which weighs more, a ton of feathers or a ton of bricks? <laughs> Good, some of you know the joke, and if you don't know, it's okay. They are the same weight, all right? They're both a ton, but like bricks, you know, like that wall, it's pretty solid, all right? And feathers, you know, you can put your hand like right through it. So the joke of that comes in the fact that the density of feathers much, 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 much less than the density of bricks. Density is actually really cool for chemists and we can use it to separate different substances. Here's kind of a cool and cheesy video with Pepsi and, uh, and Diet Pepsi. First, the can of Pepsi is dropped into the water. Note that the can sinks. Now the can of Diet Pepsi is dropped into the water. Note that the can floats. What causes the difference in densities? Pepsi contains sugar and Diet Pepsi contains aspartame. Sugar solutions are more dense than aspartame solutions. Substances will actually, if you give them enough time, they actually separate out. The densest things go to the bottom and the lightest things go to the top. The official name for this is superposition. We don't need to worry about that too much. But anyway, if you let things sit long enough and stuff, they will. If you throw a rock in the water, almost all the time the rock sinks, all right? Rocks are more dense than water. However, if you know about pumice, which is a special type of volcanic rock, you throw those in the water, they float. <laughs> So it's kind of cool. Things will separate out instead of density, which is kind of cool. Here's gold and here's mercury. These are actual numbers associated with the density of these materials. This number here for gold, 19.3, there's 19.3 grams per centimeter cube. Now, centimeter cube and milliliters are the same thing. We're going to start seeing this more and more. So in a milliliter of volume, you would have 19.3 grams of gold. Mercury down here, same uh, type of process, in a milliliter would have 13.6 grams. So gold would have more mass in a milliliter than mercury will. So this would be more like the bricks and this would be more like the feathers. This is much more dense than feathers, but still it's kind of the same thing. But my favorite application of density by far comes from this movie. If you haven't seen this, it's a very fun movie. Hey, honey, there's nothing to fit here. Excuse me.
<laughs> anyway, this is the first Indiana Jones movie. Totally cheesy and stuff, and I'm sorry about that. <coughs> but I, could, I just couldn't read this. Um, in this story, he's trying to get this gold idol and stuff, and you can tell that what he was using was a bag of sand. And he was trying to put the sand on there to displace and stuff the mass of the idol. But what do you think happened there? What's in terms of density? What, what's the problem? Gold is a lot heavier than sand. Gold is a lot heavier than sand. Gold is one of the most dense substances known, all right? It was about 19.3 grams per centimeter cubed, and that's on the higher end of substances. Most sands are dense, but I would argue like six to eight, maybe, grams per centimeter cubed. So it looked like he was trying to look at the volume more than anything. The volume might have been the same, but man, the mass was quite different. So yeah, density, it's really helpful. Anyway, there's practical use of density besides just what showing cheesy chips of Indiana Jones movies. Here's an example where we have some polypropylene rope. Polypropylene is a type of a plastic. And it's floating on the water. But on the other hand, we've got some soda uh, bottles and stuff, and they're actually sinking in the water. Now remember that substances, given enough time, will kind of set up in terms of their density. Let's see if we can find out what the increasing density of these substances are. And again, the punchline here is you want to put the least dense first and the most dense last. So is water, do you think that's going to be in the middle? Least dense, most dense? Middle. Middle, that's right, all right. One thing, the rope is floating, the bottles are sinking. So water's going to be in the middle. And because the polypropylene rope is floating, that means that that one is less dense than water. It should just be this answer right here. The polypropylene rope is the less, least dense, it's floating. Water is in the middle. And for some reason, this plastic bottle is sinking, so that means that it's more dense than water. In recycling, they can oftentimes separate plastics by their densities, and then from there on go and recycle them and stuff like that. Any questions? Next week in lab, we're going to do a lot with density, all right? Next week, we're actually going to make measurements of mass and volume and figure out what the volume, uh, what the density might be. So remembering that density is mass over volume. And also remembering that usually density is grams per centimeter cubed or grams per milliliter. Let's see if we can find the density of this piece of copper. So we've got a piece of copper. Here's the mass of our piece of copper. And apparently this is a little rectangular kind of piece of copper. So it's this much, this long, it's this much wide, and it's this much thick. So let's figure out now what the density is in grams per centimeter cubed. Now remember that volume is a type of a unit for space, three-dimensional space. And a centimeter cube comes from the fact that like a volume, like a rectangle or a square, excuse me, it would be side times side times side, or length times width times height if it's a rectangle. So what we're gonna do on this problem, we've got the mass number right there, the 57.54, and for the volume, we need to multiply the length by the width by the thickness or the height. But do we have to do anything to the millimeter first? Absolutely, right? You've got to convert the millimeters into centimeters first. We want to have just centimeters. And if we were to go length times width times height right now, we would have centimeters times centimeters times millimeters, which would be weird centimeters squared millimeters. So we'll convert the millimeters to centimeters first, and then we'll throw it in, find volume and uh, density. So again, the first thing, let's convert that millimeter over to centimeters, so we've got the same units. There are 10 millimeters per centimeter, so this is 0 0.095 centimeters when you convert it over. Now that we have a centimeter, we're going to find the volume. Volume is length times width times height. Length times width times height comes out to be this number, 6.4 centimeters cubed. Notice here how centimeters cubed is literally centimeters times centimeters times centimeters. That's really what a centimeters cubed is. 
So if we would have used this millimeter down there, we wouldn't have had a centimeter cubed. It would have been centimeters, centimeters, millimeters, or centimeters squared millimeters. And once you have volume, then you can figure out what the density is. Density is mass over volume. 9.0 grams per centimeter cubed. Most metals are usually between about 2 and 25 for density in grams per centimeter cubed. So if you make a measurement on a physical on a substance with mass, a solid, uh, usually between 2 or so and 25. <coughs> Here's a problem we will use uh, next week in lab. And there's kind of an interesting story about this, man. This guy named Archimedes was challenged by the king, maybe with threat of death, it's hard to say. But anyway, he was the king was having a problem with fake gold getting in the kingdom. And they couldn't figure out if the substances being sold were fake gold or real gold. And Archimedes came up with this idea that you can have displacement in water to figure out what the density is, which was really clever. So let's look at this example here. We've got some random piece of metal. And notice how the piece of metal, it's like not rectangular, all right? So it'd be really difficult to find like length, width, and height on something like this. We've got a piece of metal, all right? And we're throwing it in some water, all right? And the water starts at 10 centimeters cubed or 10 milliliters. And it goes up to 22.3 centimeters. Cube. We can actually use this information to find the density, and from the density, we'll compare it to these numbers and try and find out what the identity of the element is. Now, we've already got the mass. Remember, density is mass over a volume. So the top part is there. How can we use these two pieces of information to find the volume of the metal? The difference. Difference. Well done. That's right. The water goes from 10 to 22.3 because you plot that piece of metal in. The metal is displacing the water. That's why this is called the displacement method. So to find the volume of the metal, which would be tricky by itself, you would just take the difference between these two numbers. So 22.3 minus 10.0, it looks like 12.3. That would be the volume that this piece of metal takes up. So when you figure it out, the density, mass, divided by the difference in the volumes, the answer comes out to be 2.70 grams per centimeter cube. And if you look at this list up here, that's definitely going to be uh, aluminum. So supposedly Archimedes was in the bathtub when he figured this out, and I keeping I tried really hard to keep my class G rated. So this is literally pure science, nothing weird. Uh, supposedly he thought, oh yeah, displacement of water. Like I get in the bathtub and it goes up. And apparently he went running around with hardly any clothes on. He was so excited by this uh, displacement method. But anyway, all oh, science and history, so much fun. Any questions on? Good. All elements have a density associated with them, and there's cool kind of patterns you can sometimes see. These are the patterns uh, of density when it comes to the pure elements. Um, just as an kind of interesting side note, osmium and iridium are constantly fighting for which one is the most dense element, all right? And sometimes they'll think it's osmium, and then they'll think it's iridium, and back and forth. And the problem comes from when do you have a pure sample? All right, osmium makes an oxide really readily, and getting a pure sample of osmium has been very, very tricky. So depending on the year, they fight. I think right now the iridium is the most dense, but again, I, I might be wrong. I get it mixed up, but they're both very, very dense, both about 22 or so grams. And aren't they like those up together where like even difference in temperature can make a difference? You bet. You can totally have phase changes within temperature parts. That's right. These are supposedly like the room temperature values, but you're absolutely right. Those things, too, will change and stuff. It, it's more complicated than I'm making it look yeah. here, so. Okay. Cool. 
Once in a while, we'll refer to what's called an intensive property and an extensive property. And density is an intensive property. And what that means is that you could have a really small amount of brick or you know a whole thing that fits in a truckload of brick and it should be the same density. And the same thing for styrofoam. You can have a small piece of styrofoam or a huge, huge block of styrofoam. They should have the same density. So intensive just means it's independent of sample size, all right? And that's kind of an important kind of thing. So intensive just means any amount is fine. You should be good to go. Extensive means that you do have to know how much sample you have. And this is where mass comes in and volume and time and all these kind of things, all right? So some properties are intensive and some are extensive. If you have an intensive property, it should be reflective of what, where you came from, and that's really cool. On the other hand, we deal a lot with extensive properties using the mass of a substance and the volume of the same substance to find the density, et cetera, et cetera. These are kind of nerdy things that we'll talk about once in a while. I just want you to know if you hear them and stuff what they are. Uh, here's another kind of a problem you might see when it comes to density. Uh, mercury used to be called quicksilver. It's actually a liquid metal. It's uh, fun to watch. It's also very dangerous, though. So if you see quicksilver, please put your goggles on. But anyway, let's say that we have um, 95 milliliters of density. And we want to figure out what the mass of the mercury is in grams and in pounds. All right? So we're trying to convert here a volume. Milliliters is a type of a volume. And we want to turn it into a mass, a mass in grams and a mass in pounds. We'll need the density of the mercury to do this problem. And 13.6 is the accepted value for the density. Now, I'm sure that you can all do this kind of problem, like right now, without thinking about it. Formally, this kind of process is called dimensional analysis. Dimensional analysis, or factor label, or any of these kind of things, is a way to translate one type of unit into another. And 99% of chemistry, in my, in my opinion, is really nothing more than dimensional analysis or factor label. You'll have one type of unit, and you'll turn it into a different kind of unit. Some of the units will be familiar to you, like in this problem, it's volume to pounds and grams. That's not too weird. Some of them may be a little stranger, like we'll talk about number of carbon atoms in a molecule or something like that, or the grams to moles kind of thing. But all of these problems of chemistry, more or less, are all about dimensional analysis, being able to translate one type of molecule or one type of unit into another. Um, there's lots of handouts in the companion, and there's also also things on the web uh, on how to do this, and I won't spend a lot of time here doing it, but I'll show you how we'll do it for this problem. <clears throat> um, like I stated earlier, a milliliter is the same as a centimeter cube, and that's like a definition in terms of volume. So in this problem, 95 milliliters is the same as 95 centimeters cubed. And uh, if I use 95 milliliters and Maggie uses 95 centimeters cubed, no problem. They're the same thing, all right? It just depends on which one you're going to use. Because the density has grams per centimeter cubed, it makes sense to use 95 centimeters cubed instead of milliliters. So if you do that, milliliters, centimeters cubed the same, 95 for both of them, we'll use this density. And notice how we have a unit that cancels, which in this case is the centimeter cubed, and we have the desired unit left on top. So in math, centimeters cubed on the top and centimeters cubed on the bottom cancel. This comes out to be 1.3 times 10 to the third grams. The volume units are gone, and we have just this new mass value left over. <coughs> If you wish to go to pounds, you will need a conversion in order to go from one of the metrics to the English. A pound is 454 grams. So now to do this problem, we're going to start with grams. We're going to put the grams in the bottom and the pounds in the top. The grams will cancel out. And in your calculator, this comes out to be 2.9 pounds of mercury. 
So your 1.3 times 10 to the third, or 1,300 grams, is also equal to 2.9 pounds. All right, this is a great place to stop. We'll finish it. We'll do more of this on Friday. Have a wonderful day. I'm looking forward to seeing those of you on Wednesday and Friday and uh, Thursday and Thursday and Friday.